Good morning. Uh, I am Javier Portos from uh, ITS. Uh, thanks for attending today's presentation. Uh, the presentation, it is called The Most Common Mechanisms and Reasons for Electric Motors Failures in Petrochemical Industry. The presentation will last uh, between 50 to an hour, so 60 minutes, and uh, at the very end, we will have uh, between 15, 20 minutes for questions, and you know, that should be able to, to address those. And uh, it will be instructions about how to ask at the very end of the presentation. So once again, thank you for attending this presentation. IPS is a leading provider of engineering solutions uh, for electric motors and generators in North America. The headquarters is in Greenville, South Carolina. We have about 30 locations uh, coast to coast and we service uh, repair services on the shops. We also do field service and distribution. So we have uh, about 30 service centers, like I said, and you can see on the map where they are located in the United States, including them. This presentation, the purpose for this is to discuss the most common contributor factors for medium and high voltage induction and synchronous motors that they fail in our industry, specifically for petrochemical industry. These contributor factors included design flaws, manufacturing defects, incorrect selection, or deficiency of motor enclosures, maintenance issues, and motor protection. Also, part of the purpose for this is to help end users to understand the importance that is for mechanisms that lead for a motor critical uh, motor failure. So meaning, you know, what actually lead for these motors to fail prematurely on the field. We also want to talk about maintenance practices. They are designed to keep this uh, critical equipment in optimal conditions. We will focus on general mechanisms related to early failures uh, based on you know, the first year for years of operation. And many models don't make to the uh, life expectancy that is required for this uh, critical equipment. This information is based on root cause analysis, experience history, and end user feedback. We have standards for a petrochemical industry, API 541, which is the one for induction motors, and we have API 546, which is for synchronous motors. API 541 covers ranges from 500 horsepower all the way until you know, 20, 30, 40,000 horsepower. And synchronous motors, they are uh, for machines that are in a petrochemical industry that they use brushless excitation or brush type excitation, and they are for large equipment, 500 kVA and up. Some of the criteria for these motors that they are used on in our industry, they are actually what is considered to be premium machines. The design expectancy uh, life for these motors are 25 years of serviceable life. The other criteria is they should last five years uninterrupted operation, meaning you know, for five years, you don't have to do any maintenance to it. They are used for critical equipment as defined for petrochemical processes. They also, run continuously in our petrochemical atmosphere or environment. Also, you know, when motors are uh, inactive for long periods of time, they are exposed to corrosive and chemical environment, which is very normal for our industry. Because today the high demands, you know, uh, require larger horsepower. We've seen an increase of horsepower. Uh, it's not unusual to see large uh, synchronous motors today to be 20, 30, 40, 50,000 horsepower. Also, for the uh, on the on the field, you know, when you have, for example, three compressors, uh, used to be years ago when they first uh, designed these uh, installations, they have two motors moving compressors. The third unit was used as a spare, because today's demand, you know, it requires higher production. So now that spare motor is used as a production. So you have three motors that are operating at the same time, producing 100% load each one. Therefore, you don't have any spares available. So those are also considered to be critical equipment. We're gonna talk here about uh, the reliability of these electric motors, why motors fail prematurely and how does that affect uh, the production downtime? So this, these motors, for example, when they actually are down and, 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 and you have to go to repairs, the customers, uh, they don't, they cannot deliver the, uh, expectations you know for, for producing the gas or, or for uh, pumping water or from pumping gas or for compressing gas because they have customers that they have to meet those expectations when the motors are down they literally just you know stop production and the cost for removing these motors repair and restyling that it actually takes time 
And if they are not uh, ready to do that, then it's what we call unplanned electric motor failures. And reliability engineers, you know, sometimes they scratch their heads because they have, because they're dealing with unplanned outages. So when these motors fail, they're not expecting to do that, and they have to go through all this uh, troubleshooting about why the motors fail. Especially, if they don't have units that are spare that are available. Uh, some of these failures, they could be small bearing damage, or it could be a catastrophic failure. Uh, some of these can be repaired between a week if it is just a bearing, but also if it is a complete catastrophic failure, it could take weeks. It could be six weeks or it could be eight weeks. Uh, if you don't have a spare for these motors, you know, a brand new motor, it may be on the order of 40 weeks to a 60 weeks to build one new one. And sometimes you have to deal with very expensive repairs if these failures are actually catastrophic. Some of the uh, common mechanisms that lead for these motors to fail are actually some of those are uh, design flow, which is actually by the OEMs, some manufacturing defects also uh, by OEMs, some motor installation issues that we're not talk here in this presentation. Some of those are misapplication as well, lack of protection and maintenance related issues. I put a picture here of a motor that's actually 8,500 horsepower, eight pole compressor and Inside this, what I call a box, you know, there is a lot of uh, forces. There is uh, electromagnetic forces, there is thermal forces, there is the electric uh, strength at the, this insulation system that they use for the stators. But also there is a rotated equipment that is exposed to centrifugal forces, thermal stress, centrifugal stresses on it that you don't see that, but all that takes place inside because you have to deliver a torque on the shaft. So we don't get to see that. All we see is just a box that is energized to a, a power source. However, you know, many things happen inside and we're gonna see it on the next slides. The main categories for these motors to fail, we divide that between electrical and mechanical. So mechanical failures, uh, number one is bearings and lubrication. That's probably the primary reason why these motors fail. We have another category that's called lack of maintenance of motor protection. Cooling issues also has been observed in some of these motors. Rotor rotating mechanical components can also lead to mechanical failures on it. We're gonna talk about that. And an even radial air gap. I got a picture here of a, a rotor where you can see obviously that the bearing fell and you can see the amount of force that is producing the shaft that actually twists the shaft. You can see with a 45 degrees angle. Now, this rotating components, you know, it is made, this is an induction rotor. It is made for rotor bars. They are embedded on the slot and these slots are actually with laminated uh, material that it has cooling beds and the, on this picture, you can see also how the radial cooling beds act. But when this turns, for example, if it is a two pole or four pole, you run at 1800 RPM or 3600 RPM. We have rotor bars, they are short secreted by what we call end rings. So when the motors start producing torque and this shaft start transmitting torque, there is actually thermal expansion on these rotor bars because there is current flowing through. Therefore, we have thermal expansion on the rotor bars. We do have centrifugal forces because this is starting and it's holding on by, by the bearings. And all these forces takes place in, inside the rotor. The other category is electrical failures. So we have uh, windings that they are these coils are embedded on the slot, and we we keep those coils in place by using wedges on it. Uh, this is a global BPI stator, but also I want to point it out when we talk about series lead connections, this is what I'm talking about. When you make the connections for the coils between one coil to another one, and you have parallel rings, those are uh, areas where, according with our uh, statistics, you know, tend to tend to be uh, one of the weakest points on the winding, and we see a lot of failures with that. So on the, few, on the next slide, we're gonna see, you know, how does that affect and why is one of the weakest points on, uh, on the electrical failures. We also notice, you know, magnetic wedges failures on in, in stators also, that they fail prematurely. And some, some machines like asynchronous motors, well, the, the component that normally fail the most is rotating uh, rectifiers of, you know, dials and SCRs components for synchronous motors. We have, uh, we put a, a, a table together where we, we actually uh, categorize mechanical related failures versus electrical related failures. For 100 units received on the shop, uh, mechanically failed these machines, 
we have 25 that were related to bearings and lubrication. 28% of 28 units were related to lack of maintenance and protection. 17 units were related to motor cooling enclosures. 12% it was rotor components. 7% was air gap issues. And then for 11%, it was data not available, meaning we didn't do any root cause analysis. It was no feedback from the customer, so we have no way to know, but we knew it was mechanically related. So for this, what we can learn for, for these statistics is that 25 and 28, that means that it's 53% of 52 units. They are actually, uh, we can actually improve that because that represents 53% of the mechanical failures. 53% is a big number, so more than 50% of these motors fail mechanically related to bearings and lubrication and lack of maintenance. So if we actually improve this by paying attention and doing a, a good PM on it, we can drop this number to a values where we don't see many mechanical related issues. Now, by the other hand, for the electrical related issues, 23% were related to lack of maintenance. 27 units of 27% were related to winding series and lead connections. 11% were entrant winding uh, failures, 6% on uh, magnetic wedges, 9 on rectified wheels, and 24% was that are not available. For these electrical related issues, what we can improve is these 23 units. For these 23 units, it's actually, you know, depends on how well you maintain this equipment. Now, again, we have 23 units that you can actually improve by doing a good PM on it and do a, an inspection, as well as on the uh, 53 units or 53% for the mechanical. So that is up to the reliability engineers to do a good PM and drop these numbers to a more reasonable values. Now, if we combine all these failures, mechanical and electrical, you know, we see that 46% uh, of these failures are related to mechanical and only 16% of 16, uh, you know, these units, they are related to electrical. 26% was due to the external reasons and 12% it was that are not available. Now, with this chart, we can see that mechanically, all these failures exceed way far the electrical failures. Now, these observations concur with previous uh, published historical analysis that's been done. However, none of these mechanical uh, failures have been improved and is still with the high rates today. So the OEMs haven't done anything to improve these mechanical rates failures and uh, we're still dealing with that on repair service centers. Now, one of the analysis that we did is why we've seen these motors failing uh, lately, you know. Uh, we understand that uh, the market, you know, is very competitive. The OEMs try to make motors uh, more competitive price. We understand as well that new materials, new concepts, more sophisticated software is being used to predict the motor performance, which is uh, good, but, uh, these motors today, they are, tend to be more smaller and more compact than, uh, than motors that were built 30, 40, even 50 years ago. In this picture, we show an example of a motor that is a drop-in replacement. This particular motor, uh, the shaft high, which is the bottom of the frame to the center line of the shaft, it is uh, 17 inches. Now, you can see the adapter plate that was used to actually replace the existing motor, and you can see the physical size of this motor as compared to the one that is gonna be installed. You can see you have an adapter plate to actually just match the shaft guy. But also the width wise, you can see it's a lot wider. The, or it was a lot wider, the existing motor than this one. So you can see the adapter plate is huge because this motor is gonna replace an existing motor. So that means that this motor is much smaller in size. And that proves that we've seen a lot of motors today that when we do a drop-in replacement, they try to be smaller. And we're not, see why they're doing this and what the changes they're doing in the OEM that sometimes lead to premature failures. Today, indications shows that more motors fail prematurely than 20 plus years ago. That is a fact. 20 years ago, when motors were received for reconditioning or inspection after five years of service, 15 to 25% present a mechanical anomaly related to bearings and lubrication. Now today, the rate of mechanical problems after five years of operation has raised to more than 30%. After 10 years, once these motors get pulled out from operation and they sent to the service centers, this percentage actually doubled. That means that after 10 years, 60% of these 
motors, they present a mechanical anomaly, whether they have to be bearings to be replaced or a refurbished shaft or things like that, or you know, sometimes uh, bolts that are loose and things like that on the water. So this is a very, very high rate that uh, OEMs haven't do anything about it to actually make improvements. This is an example of uh, what changes we see in the industry that lead to premature failure. You know, I'm going to talk about, you know, some of the OEMs uh, and today many two and four pole machines. Uh, they eliminate the keys actually to hold these rotator assemblies by using tight interference fit and tolerance that are this, uh, specified by design. However, you know, when these tolerance are too loose or too tight, they could actually lead to premature failure. As an example, this is an spider in the bottom picture where you can see the key on it. Then the rotor board gets, uh, uh, it gets hit up and it gets stuffed into, into the, uh, the diameter of this uh, spider, <clears throat> and then when it comes down, they actually get tight. These keys could transmit torque as well, but today we've seen many, many machines with no keys on it that they don't transmit torque, and they rely completely on the interference heat, especially two poles. That picture shows, I put a ruler on this rotor, that was a 9,000 horsepower four pole, where you can see the edge of the uh, this cooling, I'm sorry, this opening on the uh, on the surface of the rotor is actually, you see a big, big difference on the center. That means that rotor, it has some tangential force that make these packs of lamination to actually twist and be out of the line. Now, that on the field, what's gonna be uh, happening is the motor will behave with high vibration. So if you leave that undetected, then the motor will actually start falling apart or the rotor will start falling apart by creating external forces. <clears throat> So it's important, you know, it's a good practice to do uh, eliminating the key. However, the interference fit is important. Now it's not a bad design concept. It is sometimes manufacturing issues with the OEMs. The other thing we notice is for large stators, you know, some of the OEMs are eliminated the end fingers. <clears throat> this particular picture on the top, uh, the end fingers are used to actually hold the laminations for the stators. Same OEM on the bottom picture, you can see the fingers, how they actually keep press on these stacks of laminations to keep the integrity of the core. Now, we all know the stators, they don't turn. There is no you know, uh, centrifugal force on it. However, we do have magnetic field that will produce harmonics that will produce a vibration on it. But you don't have fingers on it, will actually be, start becoming loose those laminations and it will shut it out the lamps because they have uh, insulation on it and eventually it could fail. That's one of the things we noticed from, from this OEM. They're eliminating some of these components that traditionally for years have been used. The other thing we notice is the uh, insulation uh, materials today. You know, they are much better than 30, 40, maybe 50 years ago. And the epoxies that we use, the mica that we use today are more superior in quality than before. Uh, just to give an example, uh, on motors, on the old days, we used to have windings where they have what we call bolts per mill to be uh, 45 to 65, maybe 55 bolts per mill. For example, on those insulation system, when we put a ground wall insulation, we probably put 120 mils of insulation. Uh, that means that, you know, we have to use a, a, a wider slot to actually accommodate the copper plus the insulation. Today, because the electric is pushing a lot harder, we've seen designs for these OEMs to go up to 65, sometimes even 75 or 80 volts per mil, leaving the insulation thickness of these machines to only 75 to 80 mils of thickness of insulation. Now, is that going to work? It does work electrically. The electrically will work. However, it may not last. And we've seen motors experience uh, high PD because you know they are stressing out this insulation material because you're using uh, you know, less insulation material on it, then you, you actually allow to have more copper and that's what the OEMs are doing it. They are using less uh, material on the insulation and more copper on it, so that way to give you more horsepower in the same envelope. And that's what happened. Now, some of the common mechanical failures that we've seen is bearing and lubrication. Number one of the issues, that's a motor that 1500 horsepower, four pole, 2.3 TB, it was built in 2004, and after six years of service, the motor was completely saturated with oil. Now, some of these motors are remote. Nobody goes and looks into these motors. This particular one, the, uh, the oil, it was supplied by the uh, compressor console, 
And the amount of oil that was getting into the uh, into this motor it wasn't noticed by no one there. So the motor was completely, you know, going with oil inside, inside the frame, inside the winding. And because you know there is no one, there is no way to go and check these motors because the amount of oil that is required to lubricate this is very small compared to what the compressor needs. Therefore, you lose the seals of the bearings and they start this oil going inside the winding. And before you know it, you know the motor will fail. And this is the picture of how the uh, that uh, motor looked inside. So what happened is the oil start attacking the insulation, the, uh, the insulation of the coils as well as the cables. Primarily the cables. Some of these cables are not designed to operate with oil conditions. And when you have oil, you have contamination, and you have water. Is the perfect recipe to actually uh, make uh, these stages to fail. In this particular one, the the, this is the lead. It was it becomes spongy after the oil attacked the insulation and it lost the uh, the electric strength until the motor failed. This is a good question that we always been asked: uh, How often should the motors need to be inspected? Uh, most of the OEMs so they have instructions on the upper end, you know, manuals. Uh, but if you purchase an API 541 or 546, that is a premium machine. It's supposed to run five years of interrupted operation before the first maintenance takes place. However, many of these motors, they fail due to the lack of maintenance. Several motors are designed operating in the field with safe lubricating bearings, where we know if the motor is with uh, slip bearings and they are safe lubricated, that oil will not last five years. That's why you know if you have a PM, you have to either replace the oil, shut it down, replace the oil if it is a cell lubricator, as compared with force lubricator. If you have a force lubrication bearing, then you can actually have the five years uninterrupted before you actually do any maintenance with that. Because the, the oil will come from a console, it will have its own filter, you always have good oil on it. Now, because you have this system, you always have to check the oil anyway, and it's a good uh, practice to go and do oil sampling to make sure that uh, you don't lose in the properties for the oil. Now, lack of motor protection. I put a picture here for what will happen when you have a motor that you don't protect thermally. This actually is a 500 horsepower two pole, and this uh, this are the shoulder rings. These shoulder rings, uh, for the people that are not familiar with the induction squid cage rotor, is supposed to be attached to the end of the bars. They are braced with, the, uh, this is copper, and this is copper or copper alloy. They are braced together during the manufacturing of this uh, squid cage. So in this particular case, it was a vertical pump that the pump bearing get jammed and the motor was energized. So the motor was energized for 30 seconds. And, you, and literally, you know, in 30 seconds, you have a lot of energy on the stator as well as the rotor. And because the rotor is not moving, there's a huge slip on the rotor because it's locked. Therefore, when you apply full voltage, then it, it produces tremendous amount of uh, temperature on these conductors that actually brace, uh, the brace gets melted. And, you know, in my predictions, it's probably 300, 250 degrees Celsius to be, to be actually melting all these bracing. So what did that tell you? That the motor was not protected thermally. So it is important always to follow the OEM recommendations uh, for starting conditions as well as stall conditions. You want to protect the machine for uh, stall conditions. If it is 10 seconds, you know you should not exceed more than 10 seconds. Otherwise, you start damaging uh, the rotor, especially the rotor in this case. And uh, also look for the uh, uh, starting time. You always want to get some time for the motor to get up to speed. And you don't follow these uh, follow these uh, thermal limits provided by the OEMs. The chances, you know, if uh, you get another mechanical issues on not necessarily on the motor, but also on the load, it can actually affect the motor and make a catastrophic failure like this one. WP2 motor cooling enclosures uh, issues that we notice, and, and this is actually uh, we've seen in our industry. We have a lot of uh, WP2 machines installed. Uh, they are good for class one diff two. They are all used for outdoor applications. And before we talk about this, I want to explain what did the open enclosure mean. <clears throat> open enclosure by definition is the air surrounding the machine, all the air, all the cooling surrounding the machine will get in contact with internal components, meaning the stator and the rotor. Therefore, you have contamination. You try to minimize, but it will get in. Now, NEMA WP2 specifies that 
at least three abrupt changes in the direction of ventilator air. None of them should be less than 90 degrees. What that means is this is my inlet and that's my exhaust. So the air can go from one side and then there is a deflector inside that will make this 90 degrees twist and go and change in direction, then go back on the other side and then goes inside the one. So there you go, you have your three 90 degrees changes. The reason for that is because you wanna capture any you know, particles that they may be surrounding the, uh, the motor, including water uh, to be collected and not going straight into the state of winding. Now, you pay attention to NEMA, it says both intake and discharge, meaning that also for discharge, once the air comes out of the stator, it should go at the same 390 degrees changes on, on direction. That way, <clears throat> you know, if the motors are idle, there is no chance for anything to run in the motor, we go for that side. And we're gonna see some examples of that in the next slide. This is, this is a WP2 motor that is on the field. And you do have the air inlet from, from here, as you can see on the pointer. The air goes inside and there is a change of direction and then it goes up and then comes back and then goes inside the entrance. Now, this is the exhaust. And actually, if I remove this box on it, you can see the state of core. Literally, so it doesn't really meet the WP2, and it may be okay for a while. But can you imagine this motor is on the uh, it's outside, and the motor is running? Then you have no problem. There is a storm. You know, we capture all the water on these uh, different deflectors that are built inside. And if the air is blowing out from here, it's always we have pressure coming out. The rain cannot get in because you always have the motor operating. The problem is if the motor is idle then, and there is a storm, then the water can get from here. And that's a problem. Now, also, if the motor is idle and you have construction going on and you have dirt particles, you know, they, they can actually go inside the winding by the exhaust area, not by the inside, but the exhaust. So failing to that actually produce motors to fail prematurely. This is an example of a motor that it was installed in 2009 and it failed in 2014 after a storm. That was a 10,000 horsepower. It's actually a, a console called Paul machine. It's a 2044 WP2 enclosure. It came from the overseas OEM. It was moving a reciprocating compressor. This particular motor it was WP2 by definition. So when we received that, uh, it failed after a storm. When we received that in the service center, we look at the, uh, the air intakes and it actually meet NEMA requirements. The air goes in, went up, up, and they come down, so doing the, the three twists, 90 degrees uh, uh, changes in direction of the air. But when we look at the exhaust, uh, actually, you know, you can actually pick from here, and there's only 40, 45 degrees change in direction, and it was straight to the entrance. So that motor failed. We actually uh, made modifications to the exhaust to fix that one. This uh, motor actually was in 2015 when we repaired it. Few months after we repaired that one, the second unit right in the back failed within six to eight months apart. So failing to actually not following NEMA requirements, it could actually create catastrophic failures as well. This was very expensive machine, very large and very critical for the customer. Rotor mechanical components. Uh, what I consider to be a large horsepower, high speed, it is uh, two or four and six volt, anywhere between 1200 RPM to 3600 RPM. Traditionally, uh, the rotors, uh, they have not been, been an issue, you know, 20, 30 years ago. But we see today, you know, many, many rotors because they're making changes. Uh, we see some issues with that. Now, the induction motor is very simple. We don't expect to have a lot of work done on rotors as you do with stators. Sometimes, you know, traditionally it's been like a, you rewind the stator twice before you actually touch the rotor, before you actually do any work done to the rotor. We're talking about the aurora conductor bars, laminations, and blowers. You do work with the bearings and with the journals, but not necessarily with the main rotor component. Now, what we see today uh, with the high demand synchronous motors, horsepower-wise, now they are up. It's not unusual to see, you know, 30,000, 40,000, even 50 or 60,000 horsepower synchronous motors. Now, these machines, they do have a lot more components than you do with induction motors. You do have a field coils going around the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the salient poles. We do have connections, we do have blocks, we have bolts, we have connection, we have the rotor exciter, we have the rectified wheel. You have a lot more components to worry about it. 
However, we don't see the rate of failures that we see with induction motors. Now, this is one of the uh, 9,500 horsepower four pole. It's a 12,000 volt. It was built in 2012. It failed after 18 months of operation. Now, on this particular one, these are the laminations of the rotor, and these are what they call finger plates. They are actually, you know, they are not adequate because the, what the finger plate is supposed to be doing is to keep pressure on this line. Now, on this particular case, these fingers, they are very, very tiny. They are not uh, stiff enough to actually produce enough force to keep these laminations in place. So what happened is, if these laminations, the end of laminations start becoming loose because, because the rotor is turning, and it's turning in this case at 1800 RPM, these laminations can actually start moving and it will start vibrating. And when they vibrate, they can crack. And if they crack, they're gonna fly out. And if they fly out, what are they gonna see? They're gonna see the stator. And those are laminations that will be inside the winding and they can actually cut the insulation and produce catastrophic failure. This is another example. That's a 6,000 horsepower, four pole, 4160. It was installed in 2012 and it failed early in 2013. That was loose lamination. And I can tell you, you know, rotors with loose lamination two, four, six pole are not acceptable. And we had a report, an email that we sent it out to the OEM. The OEM answer was that it was cosmetic. I said, no, it cannot be cosmetic. All these lamps, if they're loose and they're turning at high speed, it's just a matter of a time, they will start fatigue, it will crack, and they will come out, and they will cut the, uh, either the board of the stator or the coils, and it will be a catastrophic failure. It's just a matter of a time. That's another example. That's a 20,000 horsepower, four pole. It was the main compressor, one of the refineries here on the Gulf Coast. It was installed by a new motor in 2012. It failed prematurely after a few years of operation. So it was a, a little bit different than what we've seen on the other ones, but 80% of this cooling vents, they were actually uh, moving out or working out of in place. Now, they also have what we have, uh, what we call as, as route. It was actually welded to the spider that it cracked and it was deformed. This particular customer, actually, they were monitoring the vibration. <clears throat> so the motor trip on vibration, they, uh, they were able to actually send the motor to the service center, we opened, the stator, we pulled the rotor out and we noticed this. So they were very, very lucky because if uh, they would not have vibration trips or settings or anything like that, these working bands, they are like knives, they will come out, they will drag the stator, it will be a catastrophic failure. On it. So they were very, very lucky They pulled it out just in time. The other thing that we noticed is uneven air gaps. Uh, you know, air gap for the people that are not familiar with motors, it is the space that exists radially between the board of the stator and the uh, OD of the rotor. That space is actually where you're gonna transmit all the, uh, the, uh, the flux and the densities and induce current into the rotor bars or conductors. And there is a lot of forces associated with that. Now, the air gaps are supposed to be eccentric, but they do take some eccentricity on it. Meaning like, for example, if this air gap in the top, it is 100 mils, and we should have 100 mils all the way around. However, if you start losing the air gap and it start becoming uh, uh, not concentric, then let's say, for example, now I have 120 mils here, and I only have 80 on the bottom, that means that it's out of the center. If that rotor is out of the center, it will actually produce what we call imbalance forces, and it will create magnetic pull in the rotor that can actually start deflecting the rotor. And if you don't pay attention to that, and you leave that on check, then it will start getting worse and worse. And that gap will start becoming larger and larger and lower in the bottom until the stator can make, I'm sorry, the rotor can make contact with the bottom of the stator. And this is one example. It's an 800 horsepower, two pole, a compressor. It's a high speed, 3600 RPM. It failed early in 2040, only after two years of operation. You can see how the rotor strike area actually matches with the uh, stator strike area. And this particular one is a two pole. <clears throat> and I can tell you, you know, the air gap changes from a high speed to lower speed. Keep in mind that these radial air gaps, they are very, very small. In the case of two pole, for example, it could range uh, between uh, maybe 80 mils to 120 mils, maybe 130 mils. That's a radial air gap. On the high speed, uh, 
area, but in the low speed, maybe 8 volt, 10 and 12 volt, these air gaps could be between 60 mils to 80 mils. They're very, very small. Therefore, you know, if that starts deflecting the rotor, it could be such that it will create this magnetic pull that will have the rotor pull out of the center line until actually make contact with the stator. And once that happens, you actually are damaging all these laminations, you shut it out that, so it's a complete restart because you can't reuse the lamps because it, it was severe damage found in that state. Some of the common electrical failures that we've seen is the end winding series and lead connection. This guy on our uh, statistics showing that that's probably the weakest point. And now we're gonna show you here what, what we call the series connection. These coils are connected in series and these coils are connected to parallel rings. And we seem that to be the weakest point because that's when we actually do these uh, bracing connections that we put insulation on it. And we make all these bracing uh, around these leads and these connectors. And we, we noticed by statistics that uh, that seems to be the weakest point. And we see a lot of failures happening in that area. So between the end turns, connections, and the, rig con and the rings on, on, on these uh, parallel rings for these stators. So that means uh, that you know we gotta really pay attention when we actually rewind these status on the leads and the connections, and also for the OEMs they need to make uh, improvements on the process that they have. Otherwise, you know this keep being the weakest point, and we see a lot of failures happen in that area. This is another one. Uh, they actually have the lead <clears throat> of the coil go straight to the cables. See a lot of machines uh, they are used. The, the cables at the parallel, parallel rings, instead of using copper and insulate the copper and connect it to the coil, they actually use the lead. So this coil will get connected into the lead and that lead gets rotted all the way out to the main conduit box. And that for us is not a, a good practice to do. We actually have many motors failing before the five years of operation. And this is one of the, uh, the failures that we see. These cables actually go face to face because they cannot, they cannot uh, hold the voltage when you do have humidity or when you have a contamination. And uh, it's just perfect stone for the motors to fail. This is another one <clears throat> that's actually a, a silicon cable that is being used for many OEMs, <clears throat> excuse me. And they use a uh, very material on it. And you see the severe tracking on it. So the problem is if, you know, you start having humidity and this is inside the box, and that humidity can travel on the need of that very material. And guess what? Because that cable is actually connected to the coil, that humidity will get in contact with the copper and then game is over. It will fail prematurely. So that, that we see a lot of models and we really need a lot of models after five years of operation because of that issue. Now, being an electrical engineer, you know, I always thought that the majority of the failures will happen or will take place in, uh, in the uh, a grounding area, which means the coil embedded on the core. However, it's not the case. We've seen most of these failures happening between the series and lead connections, which is only is, is 38%, and end turns, which is uh, 25%. So with that, it represents 63%. So 63% of all these winding failures happen on the series lead connection and winding end turns, meaning that the tracking unit happen on the winding overhang, for the people that are not familiar with the winding entrance, is actually the portion of the coil that stick out out of the core. The winding in the slot means the portion of the winding that is embedded in the slot. But we only seen 18% of that to be happening, taking place on the, on, uh, on, the, uh, on the slot. That to me brought my attention, why we have so many failures, but it's not and the grounding area is actually on the entrance and serious lead connection. So we, we, that's, that's something that brought my attention. And uh, there is uh, something that we're gonna talk about in the next slides about how can we minimize this. Now this is based on uh, all the voltages. It's not a just particular 13A, it is for motors ranging from 2300 volts to 13.8 kV. Uh, and it's on uh, any size of motors. Some of the common electrical problems uh, we've seen is also lack of maintenance. That's probably number one contributing factor in the state of failures. Open motors require more frequent cleaning and, and than total enclosed machines. Now, total enclosed machines, let's define what total enclosed machine is. Total enclosed machine means that the air surrounding the machine will not get in contact with the internal components. So by definition, you have uh, 
contamination surrounding the motor, we're not getting contact with the inside the winding or the rod. Now, the lack of maintenance that we observe for this open enclosure, which is with only P1 or only P2, you know, they, they will have issues because the contamination will get in. If you don't clean it up the filters or you don't put filters on it, then this harsh environment that we normally see in our industry, it will get inside the winding and it will start contaminating. So once you start contaminating, it could also affect cooling issues, you know, because you can start clogging the uh, ventilation passengers that we have either in the state or the rotor, and the motor will start actually uh, getting warm. So what we see also on these statistics is that uh, open motors as compared to total enclosed, we see the rate to be four to one meaning for every totally cross motor that we see to have winding uh, uh, issues or failing electrically, there is four of the open motors, meaning they are related to contamination on the end windings. With that in mind, uh, we have cases, this is another one, totally cross versus open machine. On the left picture, that's actually a 15,000 horsepower, different OEM than the right picture, but it's a similar machine, 15,000 horsepower, four pole, 13,800 volts. The enclosure was totally enclosed water uh, air cooled, meaning it's a totally enclosed motor with a water heat exchanger on the top. That is after 10 years of service. You can see the entrance there looks very prestige. It looks very, very clean. On the right side, it's a 14,000, very similar size, four pole as well, 32 kb, but the enclosure was only P2. This is after eight years of operation, a little bit less than what we had on the left picture. However, uh, you see a lot of dirt, you see a lot of contamination on the entrance, even farther on the cooling vents, you see some of these are start getting clogged. So that will actually affect the cooling of the motor. We start uh, getting warmer on the motor, running hotter, obviously. And this particular customer claimed that they change filters frequently and they clean the filters, but you still have, see a lot of contamination on the end winding. Now, with that in mind, you know, if you're gonna purchase brand new motors and you're gonna be running an environment where it's harsh, you will have a lot of dirt, a lot of contamination. You may wanna ask to specify a motor to be totally enclosed machine with water heat exchanger. Now, water heat exchanger, the only issue is you need to have water available. But if you do have water available, it's a little bit more expensive, but you can justify, especially today with PNs have been extended longer. I, I still remember when the PNs used to be every three, five years, uh, but today, you know, the, 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 the outages, they've been extended to uh, more than five years, sometimes seven years. They want the models to be run continuously for seven years before they pull it out, or even 10 years. So you have that as a part of the, uh, your outages, then you may want to think about uh, using a uh, totally enclosed water heat exchange machine as compared to the OLP2, because you see the, uh, the, the amount of uh, contamination gets reduced drastically on the state, or therefore you don't have to pull it out that, as often. Now, the other is uh, another option is some of these motors, they are open. This is one example, it's a 15,000 horsepower. That particular unit actually fell on, on the field after a storm, it gets rewind, but the customer didn't wanna deal with WP2 motors no more because it cost for them a lot of production because that was one of the critical motors. They didn't have a spare on it and it was converted from WP2 to TWAC, that's the same motor, but it was converted from open motor to TWAC now, it offers a great opportunity because TWAC thermally can be the same size physically as open motors WP2. That means that you don't have to derate the machine. If you convert from a WP2 to TWAC, you don't have to derate the motor. You can still produce in the same amount of power, in this case, the horsepower uh, at the same speed and with no derating factor. Now, what is the benefit of using that? You can actually uh, have the state that will be a lot cleaner than what you have with the open motors. And remember, when we have storm, there is water, there is oil, because we always have leaking oil on these seals, you know, after years of operation. And nobody's gonna stop these motors just because you have a little oil leak. And, but when you have oil, you have contamination, the case of open motor, and then you have water, that's perfect storm to actually make these motors to fail. Magnetic wedges. Uh, on previous API specs, they did not prohibit to use them. Uh, we had it. We actually seen a lot of models with magnetic wedges. Uh, on the latest API 541 fifth edition for induction motors, uh, they now they put a, a restrictions and uh, they should be used for certain horsepower for certain frames, and they're allowed to use now magnetic wedges on, on these models. Now, there is no question about uh, 
how the performance can be improved by using magnetic wedges. You actually have better efficiency, better power factor, the winding temperature is lower, the uh, the uh, starting torque also is it's, it's better, it's higher, lower inverse. You get all these benefits by using magnetic wedges. So the concept of magnetic wedges is great. When we relate this to be an issue is more between manufacturing issues. We find out that uh, when we have these uh, wedges failing, they are related to installation methods that they use, the BPI process that they use, these materials, uh, wedges, uh, in combination with the resin that they use and the epoxy under the BPI process, they're poorly actually glued into the slot, and that's why these wedges start failing. Also attributed to material that they use for these wedges and the air gap dissymmetry that we found in thermal data. So I'm going to show you some pictures about you know why these wedges start failing. This is an example of uh, on the left one we have a 2250 24 vertical motor. It was on a pump station. Uh, it failed after five years of operation. Actually, it did not fail. I was calling to the site. They have three pumps uh, operating, and this was pump number two. The first pump uh, didn't hear any noise, any magnetic noise on it. On the uh, second unit, which was this one, you can hear a really high pitch noise on it, that it was not normal. The third unit didn't have any magnetic, you know, strong pitch noise on it. So it was obvious that unit number two, something was different on it. So we checked the air gap. We didn't know we had magnetic wedges, by the way. We checked the air gap at the top and the bottom, and it was to be okay. It was concentric. It was not an uh, uneven air gap. So we recommend them to do an inspection in the shop. So we, we actually open it, pull the rotor out, and we find out that 30% of these wedges, they were disintegrated. They were completely gone. So once again, you know, when you have wedges that are gone, in no particular order, you do have strange uh, magnetic noise because your air gap gets affected by that. Once you start losing these wedges, then your air gap becomes larger. And the same effect that you will have with an even air gap will take place when you start losing the wedge. In the right picture, we have a 600 horsepower, two pole, 4,000 volts compressor. After eight years of operation, all these wedges, they start walking out, they start migrating. Now, if these wedges, they are made of laminated iron, if they come out, and, and, and you have the rotor turning right here and some of these uh, wedges material left get in contact with the rotor, the rotor will strike them back and they could be like a knife and they can actually cut the insulation. And once they cut the insulation, then game is over, the motor will fail and it will go to ground. For uh, rectified wheels, uh, we seem that to be part of the uh, statistic that we seen uh, these uh, wheels to fail or uh, the wheels that are used for synchronous motors to rectify uh, AC into DC current that goes straight into the main field of the windings. These wheels, they actually use dials and SERs, also modules, and they have wiring. So they have these rectified components. Uh, they are installed, and these components, actually, the wheel, it turns at the same speed as the main rotor. If it is a four pole synchronous, it will run at 1800 RPM, all these components. And if it is a 20 pole, it will run at 360 RPM or lower if it is a reciprocating compressor. So we seen these uh, uh, OEMs that typically they are different. All the OEMs, they all have ACS uh, diodes components, but they don't share the same uh, types of components and they, they have their own particular parts. Uh, we attribute this to be uh, mostly about corrosion, you know, because we have wires, bolts, and uh, and to these components that uh, it will actually attack the, the wires and the, the uh, connections. And the second option, the uh, second uh, contributor factor that we see is based on motors that they start uh, several times. Uh, once you have this motor start several times, it will actually have current going through these conductors of these wires and diodes and ACRs. And we see that to be contributed also to overheating and therefore, you know, start getting these cables to get toast and to get. Uh, you know, with the corrosion and with humidity start to get in a brittle and they start cracking and that's when you see this failing. Uh, now, this is an example of uh, one of these uh, components. It fell after only seven years of operation. The reason for that was corrosion. It was corrosion buildup, especially, you know, these motors, sometimes you don't operate it continuously. You have the machine idle for, let's say, you know, two, three weeks and we have high humidity in our Gulf Coast. Of course, that's normal for us in the summer. 
So the humidity will start building up, and sometimes we don't even have heaters on these uh, wheels components that they will actually start uh, condensate and corroding all these uh, components. The other thing is because they actually, all these components, they have to be mechanically secure. We observe that some of these insulators that they use and the bolts, they may crack because uh, the material will absorb moisture. And once they become dry and start running, they actually could crack because they're holding components. And remember, these components, they're gonna turn at the same speed as the main rotor. So if it is a four pulley, we'll run at 1800. Everything will have centrifugal forces associated with that. This particular one failed after three years of operation. Now, how can we actually improve reliability and reducing this failure? I can tell you, you know, based on our experience, uh, you guys as a customer know better than anybody else uh, about the site conditions for the model. When the OEMs design this equipment and they produce a, a instruction book for it, they do have genetic information on it, but it is up to the uh, end user to actually uh, know what's surrounding the motor, what conditions will affect, and how you actually gonna do the predictive maintenance for that particular unit. These motors, you know, they, they should be recording the vibration, bearing temperature, and stereo temperature, establishing benchmark. You know, we also assume that because it's a brand new motor, they are trouble free, and it's not gonna fail. The way I think is the other way around, because I don't know this equipment, I should at least establish a benchmark Start looking into full load to see what is the behavior of the motor, what temperature you're gonna see, what is the running temperature for the bearings, and what is the standard vibration when the motor is fully loaded. With that, after six months, you start trending, making sure that everything runs fine and it gives you some kind of comfort, uh, making sure that none of that will actually run an anomaly. Now, if you experience anything abnormal, whether it is a higher temperature vibration for the same amount of load, then you need to investigate that and uh, start addressing any issues that you may have. How can we increase that reliability? Uh, one of the things that we always look first is the, uh, the application side. You know, make sure that the motor, when it's installed, it was actually designed to do the job. Uh, whether it is the enclosure, whether it is the shaft, whether it is the type of bearings that it use. So it's always important to know that that motor, as far as the application is concerned, it will actually move what is supposed to move, whether the motor is a compressor, it's a receive compressor, centrifugal compressor, whether it's a pump, or whether it is a fan application. Now, monitoring the equipment is important. It doesn't make any good if by standard for API, we're always gonna have provisions for vibration probes. We're always gonna have minimum of six or nine RTDs, three per, per phase on the winding. We will do have all the time bearing RTDs. We will have differential pressure switch in case of there is an open motor. We will have de leak detectors if it is a keyword like this case, but none of these will help if you actually don't hook it up this equipment and monitoring the temperature. So this particular one, you can see there is a space heaters as well. Uh, there is a RTD auxiliary boxes, but none of that will help. The motor by itself cannot protect by itself. You need to actually monitor it, uh, that uh, performance of the motor and make sure that it's protected properly. The other way to actually increase reliability, and I seen that uh, when I was with OEMs, uh, we always pay attention to the stator. And even in the API, there is a lot of uh, holding points and inspections that they do in process during the manufacturing of the stator. And very little is actually about the rotor. It is important to actually pay attention to the rotor. Look at the integrity for all its components. Look at the lamination, the spider fit, stacking, the bar slot fit, radial bend, the end fingers, make sure that you have a good, a good robust motor for your operation. I'm questioning that to the OEM. Now, by the other hand, remember we talked about the weakest point of the state of winding? Perform a water seal conformance test is important. On the, on the bottom picture, we have actually a, a water immersion test performed on an IPS, and uh, or this is one of the mega seal insulation system. So you submerge the whole state on the water and you actually measure the stator before you apply AC high voltage. So what you do is you measure before and then you apply 115% rated voltage for 60 seconds, meaning if the motor is at 13.8 kV, you apply 16,000 volts AC between copper to ground and the motor is underwater. After the minute, 
you measure the state of again, and then you compare measure before and after. If there is no change of the measure, means that the insulation is sealed. What peace of mind that give you? Well, because everything was submerged on the water, and we know our environment here on the Gulf Coast, it is you know, salt, it is humid, we have storms, we do have a lot of storms happening through uh, uh, in the Gulf Coast all the time, and these models are WP2. It give you peace of mind that at least you know it's a sealed system that this humidity will not penetrate and make contact with the water. So that's a good test to perform. Now, also preventive maintenance. The PM should not be just limited to doing a state of test on the field. We also need to include full vision inspection for all the major components. Doing the oil sample test is important, making sure that your oil doesn't get degraded. And based on the contamination you may have surrounding the motor, that's how often you need to replace the oil. Check the air gap. Check the air gap every, the first time that you install the motor, but also during PMs, making sure that the air gap in both ends of the motor and 90 degrees apart, let's say 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and 9 o'clock, make sure that it's even all the way around in both ends. Look at visual inspection on the on the mounting bolts, make sure that the frame did not move, especially in centrifugal compressors, centrifugal loads, that they tend to have a little bit of movement. If these are not secured properly. Also look inside, if you have like a board scope on you can go inside the, uh, the stator and look for any cracks on the rotors, making sure that there is no water or oil leaks that will actually affect the insulation. So do a, a complete inspection to it. Magnetic wedges, uh, you cannot see to the boroscope, then what you can do is always pay attention to changes in power factor, changes in noise, magnetic noise during operation. This can be an indication that you may have loose or dislocked wedges. For the rectifying wheels for uh, synchronous motors, unfortunately, uh, the OEMs don't share components. Every OEM has its own uh, rectified wheel design. Uh, so what we recommend is to always keep one spare, complete one spare of all the components for uh, for that particular OEM. So whether it is a T-Mag, whether it is Siemens, Tico Westinghouse, EM, ABB, any of those OEMs that do have parts and components. And I can tell you some of the delivery for these components, if you order those on time, it takes sometimes weeks. So it's good to have, you know, one of these components set all the time uh, at the site uh, or in the warehouse in case of you need it. Also keep uh, instruction manuals with you all the time to troubleshooting these wheels. Now, I can tell you one of these dials, if it fell, it can actually make the motor not to synchronize or have issues with the excitation. So it will trip the motor, so you really want to have all these parts and components available all the time. Final conclusion. So we talk about different mechanisms to lead motors to fail. Now, these motors, API, they are considered to be premium, and they expect to last 25 plus years life. On plant outages and repair raise many questions. Why? Because if the motors fail prematurely, let's say in five to seven years, that manager is going to ask, why? We're dealing with this if there is a brand new equipment. So root cause analysis is important. We're always willing to help customers to understand what really happened. And we work with uh, many customers and root cause analysis, try to identify so what happened so you can justify why the model uh, failed. However, most of these uh, failures happen after the warranty expired. And you actually ended up dealing with repair center servers. And that issue never gets communicated to the original OEMs, therefore, those changes on manufacturing or design flaws it never get addressed. When you have a root cause analysis, sometimes you can share that with the OEMs and that way they can take actions to it and not repeat some issues again. Witness a complete test from API, it's important, it is good, it's actually recommended. However, uh, you know, not because you pass all the API requirements, including vibration and uh, heat run and everything else, it doesn't mean that you're free of trouble. You know, site conditions, environmental conditions, installation, and protection could contribute to also to make the model fail. So it's important to also consider all this that we discussed during this presentation. Now we understand that mechanical bearings and steel winding failures are the primary concern. So we have to actually pay attention to that. With that, uh, I'm open for questions. Uh, there is a a little raising hand on the icon of the chat section.
that if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those on the chat. You go to the, uh, you go to your uh, webinar, it will be a, an area where you can actually ask for questions. So any questions, comments, anything you wanna share, you know, be happy to entertain. Don't be afraid to ask. I will keep it secret. I won't say names. I'm just gonna pose the question and answer. I'll say here. Hey, so we do have some people with their raised hands. So I'm gonna call on some of you guys. Um, let's see, Eric, you have your hand raised. I'm unmuting you now. Go ahead, Eric, ask your question to Javier. Um, you were talking about measuring the air gap and um, I was wondering uh, in a shredder motor where there's kind of limited access, uh, what would be the procedure and the tools that you use to measure? Or is it just a standard feeler gauge? Is this is this motor an induction squid gauge or that's a one rotor or that's a synchronous? Do you know? Um, I I can't recall exactly. They're uh, uh, shredder motors. Yes, uh, let me. Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I can tell you the API requirements. They always have openings designed to actually measure the air gap because we know it's important. Other industry okay. like cement plants and pulp and paper and metal industry, like the case of shredder motor, uh, sometimes they don't have these openings to check the gap. So what I would recommend is to open it from the top and put some gauges on it and make sure that you have a good gap on it. Shredder motor, they do have a lot of mechanical impacts on it that you need to make sure that you don't have a concent uh, you don't have rotor days out of a concentric area. Otherwise, it will do the same thing. It will start having forces that will actually make the rotor to, to go uh, uh, like with a pull out and it can actually contact the stator. Now, for shredders, the gap, your gap is much larger than a regular motor. It's not just a compressor. You will have probably 40, 50% larger air gap on a shredder than what you do have for a, a regular compressor motor. Okay, and uh, I guess we would have to contact the OEM to find out what that gap is supposed to be? Yes, you can do that or you can actually measure that. And, and what I do is, you know, you can get all the measurements and then we do the average. And typically, it depends on the size of the gap. It's no more than plus minus 10% variation. If you get more than that, then you start running into a risk that you are producing enough eccentricity on the rotor that will actually uh, produce uh, additional forces to the rotor that can actually uh, make the rotor fail. Right. And is it uh, you just use standard filler gauges? Yes, filler gauges. That's what you use. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, that that was my main question. Awesome. Great, Eric. Oh, I'm sorry, Eric, were you done? Yes, yes, thank you very much. Okay, I'm gonna mute you again and we'll go on to our next raised hand. Um, Kevin, you have your hand raised. I am unmuting you now. Go ahead, Kevin. Ooh. Yes, hi, this is uh, Kev, Kevin O'Sullivan with Colonial Pipeline. The question I have for you is, how much of that preventative maintenance can be done on site where the motor is located? Or does the preventative maintenance have to be pulling the motor and bringing it into a motor shop? What, what's your recommendation on that? Hi, Kevin, thanks for joining. Uh, yes, uh, I know you have probably pipeline, you're talking about pipeline motors where they are remote and there is really not a lot of people, you know, that go and look into the motor. Uh, typically, you know, what we see for induction motors, uh, 
five years. That's what we typically see. Especially you have open motors, the only P2 motors, you probably have large installation of that. Uh, after five years, we really recommend, you know, to pull those motors out because you do uh, several starts on those models because that's the nature of the application for pipelines. And after, you know, starting this motor several times, maybe after four or five years, you probably need to look and make sure that we don't have broken rotor bars, make sure that the uh, insulation is good, that there is no contamination. So five years, probably a good time before you actually experience to see any, any premature failure on this, these units. Thank you. Okay, um, one moment, I'm gonna mute you, Kevin. There you go. Um, we had a question from Matthew. He said, when measuring air gap, is this just done with feeler gauges and is the recommended air gap on the data plate? Yeah, the air gap is with the field gauges on it. Uh, and it's typically, you know, at least you should check uh, in three different positions on around the stator. Uh, Many times you don't have the four uh, positions available. So you can do three at least, you know, 12 o'clock, three o'clock and nine o'clock. And that way you can have a pretty good idea of what would be the average air gap for the dry M as well as the non-dry M. So if you do have, you know, you need to check both sides because you can have actually the air gap to be uneven in one side and not in the other one. So you use straight gauges on it. Uh, if you don't have that ways to do on the three, at least to do two, uh, most likely, you know, what we experience, the uneven air gap, it happened between top and bottom. So it's important to at least check the top. And in the top, let's say the average air gap, it is 100 mils, and you're already checking the top. If that's the only point you check it, and you have uh, 130 mils, that's a problem. You know, that's a problem. It's way off. You have 105 mils, that's probably okay. You're expecting the bottom air gap to be almost the same, or 95 mils. So, with one point, it gives you an indication, but it's better to have three points because normally you see all these uneven air gaps to be actually just top and bottom because the radial forces, that's what it takes place. And the rotor weight, you know, it will, it will also place a, a factor on it. Okay, we have another question for you, Javier. Um, what can you share about losing lubrication from bearing seals and what can we do if a motor is leaking oil? If we're talking about forced lubrication, what we see on the field is uh, we tend to use, if, if this is a forced lubrication bearing, I will assume so. If it is a forced lubrication, normally the OEMs, they do, an, they do have an orifice that for you to adjust the pressure what I see on the field is sometimes we adjust the pressure for the compressor uh, and uh, we have the same console sharing the same oil with the motor. And sometimes the pressure is so high for this uh, uh, piping, for this oil that goes inside the bearings that blew up the seals. And uh, we have no way to check that. What we would recommend is to always have a way to check the pressure in the inlet of the uh, of the bearing. That way you know that you're controlling the pressure or at least you know that you're not blowing out seals. These bearings, these seals, they are actually designed not to absorb a lot of pressure on it. And depends on the size of the bearing, that's how they will recommend how much pressure oil you should put on it. And if you put more than that, you can actually uh, blow it up the seals and then you will get oil inside, inside these uh, stators. So pressure gauge, that's, that's what we recommend to use. Okay, that's all the questions I had written in. Does anyone else have any questions for Javier? Um, Eric has another question. Um, I'll unmute you, Eric. Go right ahead, Eric. Yeah, I was just wondering if uh, we can get a copy of your presentation. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and let me tell you another thing. Uh, just as an appreciation, IPS, you know, will provide you, uh, we will receive an email from us with a gift card uh, for you to have the brunch. I know we call this brunch and learn, and there was no lunch on it, <laughs> but uh, we, will, we will send you a, a gift card for you to uh, to have a brunch uh, in, in IPS. Okay, um, I would, thank you. Uh, I was just writing some notes here. Um, from the pictures that you were showing, it looks like, to measure that air gap, you would have to 
go pretty far into that motor. So mm -hmm. this wouldn't be something that you just use like a 12 inch fuel jet gauge. It, it, it would need to be longer than that, right? Yeah, they have to, they usually long gauges that we use, you know, to look into the air gap. So sometimes you have to go from the top, from the top, you have to remove the air portion, you come from the top and you stick the gauge to it. So you have a blower, you have to find a way out to actually get the gauge into the air gap. It's not, uh, I wouldn't say it's difficult to do it, but it's not an easy task to do it, but it has to be done. And it's, you know, how, how long are your gauges? Well, they could be, uh, you know, if, if it is a large model, you need a long one. You need, you know, very flexible. And, and sometimes, you know, you need a few pieces of gauges on it. Or you can get the guy, one of the field service guy going inside, you know, came into the motor on the entrance and then stick the gauge on it. So field service okay. people will help you to do that if you have no way to do it. I would primarily check, as you can see, remove the bracket. Sometimes this bracket with a half moon so the top bracket can be removed and then you get access into it. That way you can see the top and bottom of the uh, the gaps, the radial air gaps. Right, and that would be, so, and so I, you I, can I agree, that would be a, yeah, that would be the easy, be a, a minimum the access. But if you have a bracket that is round and is no half moons that you can remove, then you have to go from the top. Okay, um, and one last thing, uh, you spoke of a, uh, uh, a, a differential. You gave an example of if you've got 100 mils on the top and or, or 130 mils on the top and 100 mils on the bottom, then 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 you have a, a problem. Is there a, a baseline for you know if you're greater than X, then you might have an issue. Yes, uh, typically the OEMs they recommend plus minus 10 percent from the average. 10 uh, percent. 10 percent and but the thing is you know a 10 percent of a 80 mils you know it may be not much different than 10 percent of 150 mils so i would say case by case based on the application we would probably consider that case by case because you know you're talking like at the other that's redder it's different if it is a centripetal compressor if i only have like a 60 mil right. you know 10 percent is very small so right. that variation may not be adequate. So it depends on the air gap, the application, and the size of the motor. Okay. And well, you, thank you, you, very have much. The, you have the specifics. You can send me an email, and we can talk, you know, about your specifics. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, Javier, we have a few more people um, who have asked questions. Sean, um, I'm unmuting you now. Sean, did you have a question for Javier? <laughs> Yeah, Javier, are you available to come outside and do additional training and or to maybe help with some troubleshooting for problem children on site? We do that. Uh, we do that all the time. IPS, you know, we do a lot of uh, troubleshooting with motors, synchronous and induction. We help customers, you know, to uh, that's part of the things that we do. Actually, I do a lot of that. Unfortunately, we don't we can't travel now. That's what we do in the virtual training. But definitely, once we go through all this, uh, uh, you know, pandemic thing, we are available to travel to the site, and we'd we'll be happy to help you out and troubleshooting your, your equipment. Okay, thanks, Sean. Um, let's see. I have Kevin. I am unmuting you, Kevin. Go right ahead, Kevin. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, in terms of filters for the WP2 motors. Do you have any recommendation besides the, the traditional stainless steel filters? The standard traditional uh, filters, uh, they are actually because they are supposed to be washable. You, you can wash them and reuse them. That's the reason why they use it. Now, the mesh that they use are actually designed to minimize the entrance of foreign material. Uh, there is another one that is aftermarket that uh, is a, like a pre-filter after the main filters that I can I can give you the name and recommend what brand to use, and that actually helps because it actually it is designed that filter to capture any water. You know, if you have rain and things like that, it will not it will allow the air to go through, but it will not allow the water to get in. So that's pretty pretty nice filter. It's aftermarket. I can send you. You send me an email. I can send you the uh, the uh, OEM for this particular filter that you can use. And that helps a lot, especially when we have models only people that they've been attacked by by stormwater. 
that that's good. My my second question is in terms of oil, we're we're looking at moving to synthetic oil in our motors. Do you have any recommendation on what you what synthetic oil you'd highly recommend? Yes, I can send you a list of the uh, synthetic oil. Uh, you just have to tell me, you know, because we have motors on the high speed, like a two and four pole, that they use different uh, ISO BG than you do have with the low speed. So I don't want to put a generic brand on it or name until I know exactly what uh, oil you have. Typically, you know, that oil is specified by OEMs. It will be on the motor outline or in the instruction book. And if you tell me uh, ISO BG32 or, or 60A or something like that, then I would recommend for you what you needed. But you have to tell me what oil that you try to use with synthetic. Good. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Does anyone else have any other questions for Javier before we end today's uh, webinar? No, no question. <laughs> well, yeah, I really want to appreciate you guys uh, attending this webinar. Uh, hopefully, this will not be the last one. I appreciate your your, your participation. I appreciate you guys, uh, you know, listening and, and looking to this presentation. And uh, like I said, you will receive an email with a gift uh, certificate uh, for you guys to have brunch. Um, thank you and get uh, enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>